Hello and welcome to a very special episode of Tinfoil Helmets, your occasional spicy hot take roundup of the latest F1 rumors with all the believable conspiracy theories to back them up. Everything here is carefully researched for hours to make sure it's totally founded in logic, reasoning, or truth, or not. Who knows? And today we're uh, talking about all the drama that happened over the summer break. So much drama. Yeah, uh... What th- this is like the most boring summer break in the history of F one summer breaks. I mean, it's it's been terrible. I I am I am I was expecting a lot more from this this silly season. In fact, it's not even been vaguely absurd. It's just it's terrible. It's just an off season. What is this? This isn't Formula One. I, I think the silliest thing was it took us like two weeks to get a, a topless George Russell photo. It did two whole weeks, and because we are committed journalists and we make sure that we follow all the appropriate avenues, we were checking everywhere. And we can we can verify it took two weeks for George Russell to not be in the water and have his top off. Yeah. It's a shocking turn up. For I had to follow him on Instagram. It was terrible. You followed him on Instagram? Oh, I'm sorry for you. I know how you feel about George. And I, I follow him anyway, just in case I get cool and exciting things. Uh, but for you to do that, man, that is... See, we are a dedicated set of podcast hosts. Maybe one day we'll actually start uh, an Instagram or something for this uh, for this podcast. Then we can have some social media content to go with it. And then we can just have that account follow him. That would be great. And then we can we can make absurd comments to him and maybe he'll respond. Maybe we'll get him on to interview and you can berate him endlessly for 45 minutes. Oh, that would be hilarious. Anyway, uh, so let's... Uh, we had some predictions for the summer break. Um, Otmar to, uh, to Andretti, which, you know hasn't been announced yet but it hasn't not been announced yet so i'm just gonna leave that one in limbo uh as we did mention uh george did post himself with a shirtless picture at a beach resort destination indeed seems like uh beaches were definitely very popular amongst the uh, f1 drivers they were even even lewis went to the beach yeah lando was at the beach so much beach yeah there's a joke in there somewhere about ken and the barbie movie and their job is beach (laughs) uh Still haven't seen it. Oh, it was very good. Um, Yeah. Uh, Valtteri and Tiffany had plenty of cycling content, including uh, Lance Armstrong, uh, a nice Lance Armstrong cameo, which I was trying to think of um, who's the F1 equivalent of Lance Armstrong, and I could not come up with one. Oh, uh, that's that's really interesting. The the closest I could get is if, like, uh, Flavio did Crashgate for, like, seven years in a row. Close. Close. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to think of I'm trying to think of teams which have consistently and repeatedly cheated, and most importantly got away for it for an extended period of time. And I can't think of them. They all got caught pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Like the Ferrari engine uh, burning engine oil might be like the closest, but like that was very much a slap on the wrist of like, could you stop doing that? And it was only one season. And and. And most importantly, it didn't net them a world championship. It was allegedly almost one season. You go back to like the season before and there was smoke pouring out of their garage in Bahrain. Like we, we don't know how long it was going on for. <laughs> we, we just know it finally started really working. Speaking of topless pictures and beaches, did we get any Valtteri and Tiffany content on the beach? Uh, no, they've been in Colorado riding bikes, getting ready for uh, Steamboat Gravel. They're the only ones that didn't go to the beach. We did get an almost... Full naked pic of uh, Bottas, so I assume that will be released later in the year to help shore up his earnings. Uh, The more and more uh, I see Valtteri's non-F1 content, I am convinced that when he inevitably fails to secure a Formula 1 contract, he will be full-time gravel bike racer. Yes, I would agree with that. If nothing else, he he could be a full-time gravel bike racer in support of his better half, Tiffany. That's true. They, uh, yeah. We'll see how the gravel cycling rules go. This is not going to turn into a gravel cycling podcast by any stretch of the imagination. Never say never. But uh, Super Worlds was fantastic. Uh, I, I went through the summer break watching all seven days of track cycling at Super Worlds. It was fan- It was absolutely great. Strangely, I, I didn't see anything on the news other than the initial um, thing that happened and people blocking the track because of something they were protesting. Just oil, I think it was. Yeah. Um, or stock oil or whatever the hell it was. But I'm surprised I didn't see any more coverage of it, whereas normally I'd see cycling coverage show up in my feeds. But it's very suspicious. It's probably because it's Glasgow and nobody could get out. What, what's the joke? Um, happiest city and most stabbings? Yes, I think that might be it. It's a full circle of life. Right. Uh, and then uh, we had one more of Lewis retires. Uh, yeah, apparently I was wrong on that. Uh, and judging by the, 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 the 
warblings and hints and drip and drab of where the contract is it's it's coming soon and unless they've been you know completely locked down the pr and managed to spin it in a positive manner i'm clearly going to be wrong on this one i mean nobody says it's a driver contract that is true they did make comments that it's not they have not been discussing an ambassadorial role for uh lewis toto said that so uh and then for the uh, the best laughs of this roundup, I've pulled back the season predictions we made in Bahrain to see how far off we uh, we might be so far. This should be interesting. Uh, we'll start with mine. I said uh, what uh, Alonzo Tanya Harding stroll with a handlebar. Uh, we don't know that did or did not happen, but it, we can definitely say it did not need to happen. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, no, let's let's be clear. We don't know if Lance's drop in performance is a drop in performance, or he's just not good in the car. We we don't know, but he has struggled to with since that beginning of the season when he had the incident. So maybe Alonso has been successful in his Tanya Harding of Lance Strong. Uh, Merck will finish fourth in constructors. Uh, they're currently second and look like they are going to remain there. Uh, Lynn McLaren is coming on, but not that quick. No, I, I think this could be closer than it looks right now, though, because I think there's a good chance they could end up in... They could end up in third. Because who's in third right now? Is that Aston Martin? Aston Martin. Okay. So this, there's a good chance if they if they fix it. Yeah, they're but they're 50 points down and have Lance Stroll. <laughs> Normally you say that, those words in that order, in that type of sentence, to say, but this is going to be good because they have a secret weapon. In this case, every other team has a secret weapon, and it's called Lance Stroll working for Aston Martin. Yeah, Aston Martin has 196 world championship constructors points, and Fernando Alonso has 149 drivers points. It's not good. There were there were two, three, maybe two stories during the break about how Lance is really screwing with Aston Martin and how it's just not good. I was like, oh, the tide has turned. Yeah, uh, Red Bull used a majority of their docked CFT tunnel time in the offseason to increase their advantage and now rely on free practice systems for testing and development. I'm going to call this pretty much a win. They have been they did a great job building that car and they've been just slowly introducing upgrades and the penalties of both uh, catering gate and uh, winning the world constructors last year like does not seem to have uh, slowed them down. This, this, is, this is the... Uh... This is the story that you pull out when people talk about why we need a balance of power, but maybe we'll talk about that later. Uh, but yes, Red Bull have built a great car, and most importantly, in the context of F1, they've built a great foundation of a car. It's not just that they managed to make a thing work that one time. They clearly understand it. Yeah, I think this I think this is a case on like the budget cap side of things. Of This initial budget cap was like a good step, but it doesn't go far enough in helping teams equalize because Red Bull has such an advantage. They've built up such an advantage that uh, there was there was one thing that came out during the break of talking about Red Bull's DRS. And uh, some Red Bull engineer was quoted as saying, like, I'm amazed that other teams haven't figured out how it works yet. Like, apparently it's somewhat simple uh, why their DRS is so powerful and why their advantage goes away on high downforce tracks. So but they are very surprised nobody else has figured it out. I always find those kind of things interesting because it's a, it. I think it hints at the reality that people think that the best solutions are the most complex solutions, and often that's not always true. And most of the teams are probably running. They either know what the problem is and they know they can't adapt their car to make it work that way, which I feel is unlikely, or they all think it's something com- super complex and super magical, and it's like, oh no, we just did this thing where we used a plastic washer instead of a hard washer. It's all great. So we'll see how that pans out. And then uh, finally, and we'll see if this is, I think this is still going for the second half of the season of it's a make or break season for Lance. Um, You know, we talked briefly just now about how there's been a lot of reports over the summer break of like Lance is screwing up Aston Martin. Like, as we just said, he has, he has attributed 50 of the 196 constructors points. He only has a quarter of their points. That's that's not good because look, Mercedes is clearly like the second best constructor right now. And if you think back to the earlier races where Fernando was getting podiums and Lance was like ninth, like you pull him up to fourth or fifth and that Mercedes car is suddenly a little bit further away from the second best car on the grid rather than like a pretty good Lewis, a pretty good George and Fernando doing his absolute darndest to to pull that off. I think it's interesting to to think about it in the context of the performance of George, I think it's interesting to think about it, the performance of Lewis and in the context of Alonso being actually pretty good drivers able to extract at least when they're vibing with the vehicle more so than any other driver on the on the track. And maybe Lance is a perfectly good driver and when he has a good car that works really well, 
he can he can you know get closer to his teammate but this season maybe the car has potential but it's not easy to extract potential and that's why fernando is doing so well and then you can look at the mercedes which i think is a bit of a problematic car lewis is clearly vibing this year and i think george is i think it shows that he's actually pretty competent um in terms of driving the car and they've got they've managed to push that car maybe not further than it should be but further than most other drivers would be able to take it it, it is a 148 to 99 on the Lewis versus George points. So still a little bit on the unbalanced side, but a lot closer. And George has two retirements in there while Lewis has none. So, you know, that's not going to close the gap to 50 points because they're not getting race wins. But, you know, that could bring back, I don't know, 20 of it. Yep. Yep. Very true. Very true. Should we move on to my predictions? Yes. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, the first one was my very spicy take that Joss Capito from the former Williams team principal was forced out by Toto to stop them switching to Red Bull powertrains. Um, but it turns out I was wrong, but he was in fact forced out for reasons other than his performance of uh, managing the team. Uh, there's a story which maybe if I feel like it, I'll link in the notes. Uh, but it turns out that somebody's suing someone uh, because of basically collusion to steal money from uh, what's the the company that owns it is called dollarton capital uh somebody stole like 6.9 million with marketing budget that was spent and never got any services from it so i was wrong but also not that far from the truth it wasn't sports crimes just good old-fashioned crimes indeed if you can't if you're not going to do sports crimes what else have you got apparently the answer is just normal crimes anyway uh my second point was mark but not mark Merck biffed the car on purpose to get more aero time and to help provide a comeback story for their future TV show and movie tie-in. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm wrong on this, but currently being second in the construction does not lend weight to this. So maybe we'll see them fall off in the second half of the season because they've lent energy to McLaren to improve their car. I would say I think Merck falling off is likely because they brought so many upgrades. I'm curious where they are on like the budget cap side of things and how much more money they can actually spend developing the car. James Allison was quoted this week as saying that they have no more meaningful upgrades left to bring. However, they believe there is a lot of performance left in the car and that the rest of the season is about optimizing it, which I think is also interesting. It's clearly very similar to 2021 where it's like, we don't understand the car. Oh, now we understand the car. Now we can actually do something with it. Uh, and they said that their focus was on 2024. Yeah, uh, I would push back a little bit on they biffed the car on purpose because they were very committed to their no, si- uh, no side pod design until suddenly it was like, you know what? Side pods would be really useful on this car. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that's a big fat no. Uh, so uh, my last point was that Russell felt inferior to Hamilton and copied his helmet and was playing the long game against Hamilton. He was the development driver behind the scenes for years and slowly turned the dynamics of the new regulatory regulation car to his preferences, disadvantaging Hamilton and stealing his last chance at an eighth title. Uh, I've been proven wrong, very wrong in this season because uh, whatever whatever happened in the car between tw- uh, 2022 and 2023 has clearly either favoured Hamilton, which I think is probably not the case, but more accurately probably become predictable and now Hamilton can go ring the neck of the car and do what he needs to get done. See, I was going to actually give you partial credit on this one because okay, uh, because if you if, if you remember back to like some of the early season stuff, Lewis was very clearly saying they have not listened to me about building this car. They have not taken my feedback, which maybe they were taking George's feedback. And then finally, when they realized they couldn't get the car into the operating window they wanted to get to, they turned and took Lewis's advice. And now suddenly the car's back around. So I was going to give you partial credit of uh, George was trying to pull this off, but like mr lewis is amazing yeah let, like it's one of those has charisma uh what uh d- there was a thing with sunoda where like uh nick debris was um apparently making comments similar to like nikki lauda in the rush movie of like oh here's all like the small things i can feel with the car and like it was really impressing yuki but you can only do that if you can actually deliver performance out of the car there's a bit of a the scene in rush and loud has talked about it on uh interviews he's given uh that was very much like yeah when he told ferrari or old man ferrari of your car uh and if you do these things it'll go four tenths faster ferrari said okay but if it doesn't you're fired and the car went five or six tenths faster so that enzo knew he could trust him and uh so it's one of those things of sure you can say all these things but unless you can actually back it up you're just uh a snake oil salesman essentially <laughs> i will take that partial credit and run with it because that's all i've got i mean I, I don't think it's a bad take that i think they may have been no. trying to listen to russell and then russell is not lewis 
that is very true and i i always there was a story this week about um piastri and his adaptability and talking about i've had to adapt to cars for all my driving career because he's basically been in spec series so you you have no choice but to adapt to the car you can't fix the car uh and that that's been one of his advantages or one of the positives of being able to adapt to that car i do think there's an interesting aspect to consider for how you can manipulate the car to fit you and then how adaptable you can be and i i think it's very curious i'd love to it's the thing that i think every f1 fan really wants is you want to go and swap all the drivers around into a bunch of different cars and see whether they can be successful that's i want to see lewis in another car not because i think he needs to move from Merck, but i just want to see whether he's adaptable and can prove that he is the goat because i feel like that's almost like the the fourth unspoken uh column of your leg of the stool of being an amazing driver is can you adapt to other cars and still get the best out of it he clearly didn't last year. No, and like like that broke his streak of, you know, consecutive seasons with a race win, which is just impressive when you consider all the f- the different formulas that Lewis has essentially been a part of. So I think we have seen like Lewis's adaptability just in the sense of like, you know, he came in in what the pre-2009 formula um with the refueling and all that and then you had the what 29 to or 2009 to 2013 formula and then now you have the hybrid the the double the, all the hybrid formulas the two we had so far and now we're in the ground effect era like and i feel like it's it's only a matter of time especially if lewis stays for around for a couple more seasons as Merck like works that car better i think it's only a matter of time before we see lewis get a win in the ground effect cars which will be pretty impressive to be around for what is that five different formulas and have a win and with every single formula um yeah, I think I think that's I think that's kind of what we what we can see is separates from like the really good drivers to the actually great drivers, because like Sebastian was a great driver in that Red Bull, and he did a reasonable job in that Ferrari, but he was never like he was in that Red Bull. He was not, and I think that's the that's the other thing that still hangs not hangs over Lewis, but is the perspective of has it's not has he given up. But like, is he really fighting for it anymore? And I do wonder whether it's actually the opposite, which he knows he's never going to be successful or win in this car. So why why pour all of yourself into your car like you did in 2021 and not be successful? Like, there's no chance of it winning the championship. I don't think that was, I think that was certainly realistic, uh, realistically not on the table from maybe the first race. And therefore it's not worth it. Maybe next year, if we have a competition, uh, a competitive car, maybe we'll get that Lewis back again. I think he's definitely been around long enough that he understands like what it takes to drive on that level all season. And if the car's not there, I fully believe he's still probably working really hard with everybody back at the factory to improve the car, but there's no need to put that intense level of stress and pressure on yourself for a season that, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. And I think if you look back at some of Lewis's seasons, you know, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, where he was within the shot, but didn't get there. It's, it's definitely the cases of like, Oh, he knows what it's like to put that much stress on yourself week in and week out and not get there and i think this is a much older and wiser lewis of he's laying the groundwork for 2024 2025 if if the car's there i'd love to see a three-year contract and have him nail 2025 and 2026 would be good and then and then we can have max back winning for 2027 and 2028 before he just retires a max versus lewis battle in the ground effect cars where they can actually follow and pass would be amazing yeah, especially if they can do it in 2026 with narrow cars where there's like, you're not just eating the whole track with your car. I I, w- I would love to see that. I think that would be amazing. Well, should we talk about anything that happened between the race? We have a laundry list of things. Yes, let's talk about the extremely long and shocking list of things that happened between the race, uh, between the races. Uh, Flipper Nick. With the between race drama. And I am not with it today. Uh, so the first point here is uh, uh, there's been no drama. Not really. Uh, we have then the follow-up low-grade uh, rumor that lo- low-grade, low-stakes rumor that rumor was rejecting Ferrari. Uh, with when you read through the details, actually was a story about John Elkin going to Lewis and be like, "How do you fancy coming to Ferrari?" And Lewis going, "No, I'm good. Thank you for asking, though. You're a very nice person." And then moving on with life. I thought the, stake, the headlines were like, "Shock story: CEO of Ferrari talks directly to Lewis," and it just felt like two gentlemen, you know bumped into each other in like the supermarket and we're like oh how you know haven't seen you in a while how do you feel about coming and working for us nah i'm good thanks oh, okay next time we'll see you at the cocktail party great thanks bye yeah it, i mean it was also would you like to come to ferrari for a bunch of money well that's the color that everybody else has added but this latest reporting didn't talk so much about the money i don't think i don't think he needs the money i don't think he wants the money like like at some point you have so much money 
it doesn't really make any difference. What's he going to do with it? Like, buy more plays of his album that he releases? I don't know. Well, neither Dominic nor myself have the we have too much money problem. So if you'd like to sponsor the Formula One podcast, Tinfoil Helmets, please reach out to us at feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com and we'll get back to you. Thank you. All the slots are open and available for a low, low price. No, no, high price. Sorry, yes, high price, high price. We're very <laughs> expensive, high quality listeners. Yes. Uh, there was the um, Carlos Sainz like, link to Audi, uh, like a pre-contract deal. I don't know if you saw that. I did not see that. Please tell me more. It was a bit through the grapevine rumory of like science has been both tied to Audi and not tied to Audi for uh, what 2025. So there, there's like a thing if he signed a pre-contract with them, but I don't, it's, it seems like conjecture. Who does uh, uh, Carlos Science senior drive for? Is he still with Toyota? I have no idea. Okay. Cause in his rallying, I wondered if maybe he'd switch to the um, Audi and that would provide some data for that link. I, other than the big question about whether for whether Sauber with Audi's money can be successful, if you assume that they can be, that might be actually be a really good move because it's not going to be a complete screw up of everything that Ferrari will be, and it gives you the it has potential versus I think Ferrari's potential is has a very low ceiling. Yeah, but you get a great road car out of the deal. True, although you know you could get an Audi R8, like that's not a bad car to have. It's very practical. So I think the one thing with with Audi is you have to recognize that it's not just Audi. You have the whole power of the Volkswagen group behind you. Um, There's a reason why Audi has done well in every single motorsport they've entered. Uh, You know, I I don't think they're going to immediately come in and win, but I think that car is going to be more competitive than maybe people will initially give it credit for because you have everything that Bugatti has ever learned about building the fastest road car ever. You have what Porsche is under Volkswagen group, right? Too, right? Yes, but Audi and Porsche hate each other. Sure, but Volkswagen Group might say, hey, play nice very briefly or give them some information of what you've learned from, like, all of Porsche's success in hypercar. And so, you know, there's there's a lot of information there in that group, and they are a massive conglomerate that, similar to how we see, oh, yes, Red Bull and Mercedes have made these totally not F1-inspired road cars for them to do any sort of ground effect testing, skirting the budget cap. I'm sure we won't see anything like that coming from Audi and the Volkswagen group either. I, I, I firmly believe Audi are going to build a stonking engine. I think they're going to get that right, and it's going to be top-notch. The question I have is whether the um, aero teams in Sauber will be able to give that engine the car it deserves. Yeah, which which I which is which is interesting when you you know the the strong rumors were they were trying to buy McLaren and McLaren was like no I don't want to do that. Would you like to buy our technology center instead? Because <laughs> we'd like to get rid of that because it's a bit expensive and it's about old now and not very good. Okay, next item on the list. Sure. Uh, there was a lot of commentary uh, about Alpine and to a lesser extent Williams uh, arguing with the rest of the teams to get reduction in, or sorry, increase in either the capital expenditure or an opportunity unique to them. This was especially true in the case of Alpine to fix their engine, which apparently was like meaningfully or significantly down on horsepower. Um, And there was the the follow-up stories were basically everybody at the top, which really means uh, Merck, Red Bull and Ferrari were like, no, no, there is absolutely zero chance that we will let you fix your engine. And then they immediately followed up with, and don't you even think about introducing the concept of balance of power, which um, uh, endurance cars has had. And it's caused a bit of a ruckus because it keeps messing with everything. Oh, I just think balance of power is a great Star Trek episode. I don't consciously know which episode that was. Are we talking Star Trek, Star Trek Generation, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, Discovery, or Strange New Worlds? The original, the original series. I see, the original Star Trek. I see. Yeah. I, I've, not, I've not watched that one. It's a good um, one. Okay. Uh, my specific take on this... Um, I agree that this entire concept of... Actually, I think the capital expenditure is a reasonable thing that should be fixed or enable some of the teams that are so far behind to catch up. But this whole balance of power, let's fix our engine. A, I'm pretty sure that no matter which team, no matter how altruistic the intent is, the moment those engineers are in there and are allowed to tweak an engine and they're like, well, we could make it even faster than everybody else, they're absolutely going to go do it. Like, if everybody is going to take advantage of that opening in the regulation given half a chance or not, which means it's a complete pile of crap. Yeah, we have to we have to tune this engine for reliability. Exactly. That worked very well for Ferrari after all the stories that they had massive horsepower increases as they fixed their reliability problems last year. They, in fact, fixed their reliability problems and nothing else. If you fix your reliability problems, do you actually have to make the engine more reliable? Are you implying that the engine wasn't the problem last year? No, no, no. I'm implying that you have to, you have to change things for reliability, right? 
well, if I make this thing so much faster that it blows up, oh, well, the reliability has changed. True. True. That is actually a good point. They don't say it doesn't, I don't know whether it says improve reliability, but fix reliability problems. And and a problem is in, is in the eye of the beholder. The, this engine is too reliable. Exactly. Exactly. We could easily uh, be extracting more performance out of it if it wasn't so reliable. This engine is too good at reliability. Exactly. No, but this goes back to some of the stuff as far as balance of power goes that like I've talked about before on this podcast of like I think it would be great if they like set a horsepower target um uh, for the engines and then say like hey for this season, you know, everything combined you get x amount of horsepower next season x plus 3% sort of thing. And then it's up to the teams to say, "Oh, well we can do this more fuel efficiently. We can do this lighter and like act- so still allow engine development but kind of keep the cars on a little bit more of a level peg because if like you can if you can put out all the same horsepower and use 10 kilos less fuel in the race that's a massive advantage exactly i i agree like the fundamental flaw that i think that comes with balance of power and that your suggestion does not have is that in the balance of power you are punished for being successful right if you if you find a solution that's better than everybody else that makes everything better you are held back relative to everybody else until they are all equal and that that just that that me in my western north american capitalist pig culture just feels wrong to me but saying that everybody does a especially coming out in that accent exactly uh i can tell you son uh no let's not do that uh but but in the context of like those limits where you have a performance goal that you can't exceed there's very different ways how you achieve that right like the the way in which you achieve success can be different and that can have a meaningful impact uh next item sure uh, everybody keeps linking Lando with Red Bull. Uh, personally, I, I just I I I I don't see it. I don't know why you would choose. No, Lando is clearly going to Mercedes because he's going to follow the footsteps of Lewis Hamilton. He'll win one championship with McLaren and then move to Mercedes. I would lo- that would be great. I'd love a I'd love a George versus uh, Lando in the same car and Lando whoop George's butt. Uh, I mean but... that, and then they no longer become friends. And then George throws a or uh, Lando throws a hat at George, and then George comes back and wins the whole season the next season or no no it's 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 nico and lewis round two because they were best friends until they got into rate until they got into formula One racing then they're in the same team and then they become the best of enemies and then george will finally win his one world championship against lando and then immediately retire and then become a pundit on sky sports i will allow that everything is cyclical everything is cyclical i will allow that but i will make a statement that if we want to draw parallels and accept that history never repeats it just rhymes Lando was paired with a Spaniard in the same car for a few years and started to challenge him before he left and went to Ferrari. Admittedly, there was, oh, and the, and there's other bits in there that get more complicated. But now, so y- your story works, except because it, history rhymes, not repeats itself. Lando and George will become BFFs and stay BFFs and they will be the most amazing tag team and they'll get to the end of each race and be like okay no you can win this one no no you can win this one no no you can win this one and then Max will just drive past them while they're arguing about who's going to win the race yeah that makes sense okay I'll I'll buy that last part for sure okay Uh, I just uh, back to the point I just don't think it makes any sense for him to go to Red Bull like he's going to have to wait until 2026 because he's under contract yes I know contracts are all fungible and nobody really cares about them but like it has to wait for Danny to go through because I think Danny is the realistic person who's going to end up in that seat. And it just, I just, it just doesn't feel right. The only scenario where I can see him going to Red Bull is after Max is retired. Because then I don't think, then you're not having the argument and the fight with Max. Like, why would you go to drive next to Max unless you want to accept that you're just a second driver? And that's not Lando. Yeah, and I think... They're also part BFFs. Of, I also think part of Lando getting in the Red Bull is uh, Helmet Marco dies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> too too real <laughs> well yeah like like seriously like he, he has such control over the drivers in that program i mean they are scaling back a bit of their junior program but that's also because they have so many high quality drivers at the top right now that like do we need 20 people coming through the junior formulas to get f1 seats that just aren't available because like yuki's a good driver liam's a good driver danny's a good driver sergio's a driver max is a really good driver like <laughs> Like you and you have not to mention like a couple people in F F two who are also really good. Like you you have a you have a set of them where like they just don't have the seats. And even then, you look up and down the grid of how many drivers were in the Red Bull program at some point in time. Like they just, I don't see Lando going to Red Bull because he's not a Red Bull driver. Nope. 
no, I think it feels it's in some respects it's a little bit like the last grasp of Rome. Um, is that Red Bull's like, let's try and get all the best drivers to drive for us, not grow the talent, but like get the best drivers. And I think that that's not a good sign. And I, I think this, I could, I could have really understood this rumor after like C or uh, race two, like when the McLaren was just like at the back doing nothing. But since they brought those Silverstone upgrades where they're just, you know, now fighting for podiums, like, yeah, the Red Bull's a better car, but that McLaren is coming on. I, I think it shows that Lando and his affinity for McLaren and believing to be part of the family and wanting it to be successful is not misplaced. Yep, until the engine starts blowing up and reliability issues happen, and then he goes to Mercedes because Lewis Hamilton is going to play the role of Nicky Lauda in this case. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be amazing. It's an all-British all team paid for by the Germans. Yeah. Great. Uh, now onto some sad and somber news. Uh, the Imola cat has passed away uh, at age 16. Um, I think we should all take a moment to reflect on... Um, I can't remember what his name was. Oh, his name actually was Imola Cat, I think, because he's a, he was a, basically a feral cat. But he lived in the office at the Imola racetrack, and he was sad that he's gone. Uh, swiftly moving on to a slightly suspicious set of stories that came to light in the last few days. Uh, turns out there is a cottage industry in saucy F1 reading material. I, only one is really saucy. I haven't read them. I don't know what the content is. One of them has a very saucy title. That's true. Are, are we announcing our uh, our companion podcast, the F1 Book Club, where we read said spicy novels and talk about them? I, I don't think we need a separate podcast for that. I do almost feel like we should order them. I don't think I have the time for that. <laughs> yeah, I don't have the time for that. I do feel like I want to order them and read them, but I'm also a bit suspicious. Uh, for, for the listeners uh, who may not have heard of these, I'm going to read them in least spicy to most spicy. Okay. Uh, the first one is Stop, Drop and Stroll, the Lance Stroll Guide to Fire Safety for Kids. Per- perfectly reasonable that that's not a that's not no nope, no nope. that's not some supermarket romance novel right there that's fine I, i'm still confused why lance stroll is giving you a guide to fire safety it feels like it should have been roman grosjean do them but but whatever uh then we have charles leclerc and the terrible no good very bad monaco grand prix fantastic no no <laughs> it's just a, it's just a brilliant title uh and then the one that was the first one that started this all off was uh overtake my heart Thick Rick Races for My Heart. Number one of 69. It is part one of 69. I will say that I initially saw the one of 69 and thought it was ranked number one out of 69 in Danny Rick uh, romance novels. And I was very confused that there were 69 nice uh, Danny Rick novels. And then I realized it was only part one of 69. So I eagerly await the remaining 68. They were all authored by a lady called Anita Driver, which I'm sure is a pseudonym. No, totally, totally, really plausible name right there. <laughs> you're, you're gonna go you're gonna be at work and like some new person's gonna start and then re- name will really be like anita driver and you'll be like oh i made fun of that i'm sorry uh anyway uh so if you feel like those take for take a look on amazon we're not even going to give you affiliate links because we don't care about the revenue unless you want to send some ads our way uh please do uh but take a look at them if you feel like it or or just cash donations cash donations uh posters hats Ve- vegas grand prix tickets yeah uh, did, as a side side uh, quest on um, Las Vegas, did you see the Red Bull Red, Las Vegas promo seven and a half minute video? Yeah, I, I saw thirty seconds of it. <laughs> oh no, no, you should you should take the time to watch it just because of you know Sergio Perez pulled exactly the shortest straw available in all of straws because Max is nowhere to be seen and it's all Sergio and it's just like you've done a terrible job driving the car so you're going to do the stupid marketing crap. You know whose role that was supposed to be. Danny Danny's. Ricks. Yeah, uh, th- this is just Danny in that Red Bull seat 2025, uh, 2024 confirmed. Uh, only if Las Vegas makes it to the next year. I suppose it's already on there, but I'm very concerned it's going to be a very bad race. But we'll find out in three months' time. Hey, if there's one thing I know from Liberty Media, a very bad race means nothing when you can collect a lot of money. Indeed. Remember, we race for money. Yes, for one dollar at a time as we shake our booty. Uh, uh, anyway... Uh, next segment, your favorite segment. Oh, yeah. The best segment. Uh, occasional segment. Uh, does Blank still have a job? And as we have alluded to, this is the quietest silly season and nobody got fired. It's really bad. Ferrari was supposed to fire everybody. There was a rumor that they were going to fire everybody. And that was uh, seven days ago. And we've heard nothing. This is this is terrible. Terrible. Stand by. We're checking. <laughs> we are checking. We are checking. Do I still have a job? Uh, it's great uh, hold on uh, we are checking we'll get back to you 
They never got back to me. <laughs> the, the thing is, is you'd think that'd be a joke, but that's how it goes in the races. Anyway, uh, Spicy takes some rumors. So I think we're splitting this into two sections, right? Yeah, we got uh, uh, predictions for the second half of the season and then uh, predictions for Zandvoort. Okay, so first, second, second half of the season first? Yeah, uh, so kind of a question I would like to pose is, when does the Red Bull win streak stop? And I look through the calendar, and uh, if if you just need a refresher, uh, I'll I'll give you the upcoming races. And here we'll go. I'll I've already picked my race, but I'll just going to go down the list in order for you. And I want you to tell me when you think the Red Bull win streak is going to stop. Okay. Dutch Grand Prix. Oh hell no. Uh, Italian Grand Prix. No. Singapore Grand Prix. Maybe. Maybe. And the only reason I say maybe is it's a street circuit. Which is obviously Perez's thing, so he's going to be good. But then he's going to he's going to biff it in the worst possible way. Plus, it's Singapore, and things happen at Singapore. Oh, so are you going to go for Singapore? I, I'm not. Let's go for the rest of them. But I'm saying that's my current leading candidate. I need to hear the full list so I can have full clarity. Japanese Grand Prix, no. Qatar Grand Prix, which is pretty much like uh, um, somebody drew Bahrain from memory, no. Uh, United States Grand Prix, no. Mexico City Grand Prix. Oh hell no, they're good. He likes Mexico. San Paulo Grand Prix. Just to be clear, in Mexico it will be Max winning. It will not be Perez. Yes, but uh, Sergio's dad will be very happy. True, true. Uh, what was after Mexico again? San Paulo. So Brazil, no. Interestingly, it's called the San Paulo Grand Prix. It's not called the Brazilian Grand Prix. Yeah. Uh, Vegas Grand Prix. Distinct possibility, if only because I think that race is going to be a total random number generator. Uh, and the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix? No. Uh, I'm going I'm to go with Singapore. I went with Brazil. Okay. Okay. Why? Why particularly Brazil? Just because they've it's it's been a Ferrari track for like however long. Not Ferrari, Mercedes. Yeah, Mercedes. I mean, it was one of these, and especially with how McLaren's coming on, like it's one of these that over the last couple of seasons, Red Bull has not seen to nail. Um, it feels like their weakest track because like Dutch, no, that's Max's. Uh, Italian with their low downforce setup and their DRS, hell no. Uh, Singapore, I mean, the Red Bulls have always been good around Singapore because. They can corner very well. This year, they kind of can't, but still, um, you know, they they did well at Monaco. They did well at Hungary. So, like, sure, I'll give them Singapore as well. Um, Japanese Grand Prix, no, that car is made for the S's and every and 130R and everything else. Uh, what Qatar? They won in Bahrain. I assume they can win in Qatar because it's in a very similar track. Uh, United States Grand Prix, they've been pretty good there last couple seasons mexico grand prix i think they're good at altitude and it's sergio's home track um so i don't know sergio one of them's winning one of them's winning uh and sad paulo just seems like the first one where it's like okay i could see them not i could see like mclaren winning that one because i think the other because que- that's the other question is who's going to do it and i and i and i think it's mclaren interesting you don't you don't think that mercedes continued effectively uh lewis hamilton home race field advantage might be the first win for Lewis in a while there. Which one of these is a Lewis home race? Oh, Brazil. He's a, it's a Brazil. He's a citizen of Brazil. As your, uh, it could be, but I, I, I think it's going to go... I, I'm going to go McLaren just for the, the spice. Interesting. Um, the only reason I pick Singapore is I feel that it seems so logical that they should win, but because it's a genuine street track and it's been tweaked this year, I feel like it's exactly the perfect, perfect case for an unexpected shenanigans. Uh, I will. I will also disagree that I don't think if it's gonna if they're gonna break the duck, it's not gonna be McLaren that breaks it. I think it's gonna be Mercedes, um, which really means what's actually gonna happen is it's gonna be Ferrari that breaks the duck, and we will all just be shocked. Not no 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 uh, no, because Ferrari's not gonna win from any from back on the grid, and Charles Leclerc pole means Max Verstappen win. So <laughs> no. What what's the stat like? Max has converted more of Charles's polls to wins than Charles has by like a not insignificant. That's a that's a terrible stat by a not insignificant number. I feel so bad for Charles, but sometimes I feel like I sometimes I feel like he needs to take a break for F one. Uh, should we go on to my crazy but plausible predictions. Sure, but now I I, I kind of want to look up this stat. Charles' poll conversion rate. Uh, he's had twenty poll positions. But but I, I believe the stat is that Max has definitely converted more of Charles's polls to win than than Charles has. This does not surprise me. Uh, okay, so my predictions, which are very strange, is William gets a podium on a track where they actually have a race. Bearing in mind that the last podium for Williams 
was on a track where they didn't actually race, which was Spa in 2021. So uh, Alex Albon, Podium and Mons is pretty much what you're saying. I Actually, I don't, I'm not saying it's going to be based on genuine car performance. I think Williams in one of the tracks, because the car has got a bit reasonable reliability, it's got a good driver. And I think there is a good chance in a weird situation they're going to capitalize. I'm not sure which track it's going to be. Maybe it's Vegas, because I'm still convinced Vegas is going to be all kinds of weird. And to be fair, per your point about Monza and a slippery car, the Vegas track has some extremely long, extremely straight straights. And so that that's plausible. So I think that lends more weight, but I'm still not sure which track it is. It's when Logan Sargent comes good, man. <gasps> no, that can't happen. I'm willing. No, no, that, that, that no, that would break Albon. No, home, we're, home, home podium. He- heck with the race 10 miles from his home. You know, I say Williams will get a podium. I don't say it doesn't preclude a double podium. That is he true. He could be third and Albon, because I don't think it's going to be a win, because that'll be Max. Um, maybe. Uh, my second prediction is Alpine, before the end of the season, gets sold to someone that isn't Renault. Um, I still think there is this really good chance that either um, Andretti buys Renault, and that's the way that they decide to get into it, because basically I don't think Renault want to do anything with it. It also fits, given the fact that they had that private investment from um, the uh, TV people recently, uh, Ryan Reynolds. Uh, or I could also see GM deciding that that's how they... Because who's GM? It's with Andretti, right? They're at yeah, kind of like Andretti. It. Yeah, yeah. I can totally see GM deciding that to make Andretti happen, what will happen is GM will buy the engine group off Renault. And uh, the team maybe dies, but the engine group gets bought. But I, I'm a... I'm a I would put meaningful money as in a dollar on a real bet that that happens before the end of the season. Of all the things I've seen, that one just feels like it's it's inevitable. Uh, and then my last one. It although, could also be Porsche. Get a, get two VW group cars in there. Get Audi versus Porsche. Could be good. The, the only reason I don't think that's likely is the only reason Porsche wanted to get into it was the engine. And therefore, they'd have to have started on their engine. They really needed to be started on that so they could buy. Maybe that's what happens is the engine gets sold to Andretti and and GM uh, and Porsche decides to buy the team and do their engine thing. Although I think the engine, I don't know if you can sign on to be an engine manufacturer at this point. I mean, to be fair, if it was Porsche, F1 would find a way to make an exception for them. Actually, that's that's the thing is you get the engine to be made by uh, Volkswagen Group. So Audi and Porsche, uh, Audi with Sauber, Porsche with Renault or whoever, oh, whatever it yeah. is. Uh, yeah. So they they both they go with the same engine uh, and just a Volkswagen Group engine. And then it's okay. Who can make a better arrow? Interesting. I I could believe that, and I could see that Volkswagen. Actually, it's an interesting side part. I can see Volkswagen saying, "Oh, you two need to play nice on the engine." Um, the problem with that a little bit is technically Porsche IPO'd earlier this year as a separate business entity, still majority owned, but it's now publicly traded again, which. If you want to get really bored into the, the business of car manufacturing, you should just go read the story behind Porsche because it is so utterly messed up. It is like fraud, deception, poor business choices, Nazis. It's got the whole nine yards in it. It's ridiculous. I mean, like many great companies to come out of Germany between the years of 1940 and 1944. It's very true. Uh, it's just an inevitability in life. Ra- racing suits by Hugo Boss? Wait, that's Alpha Tori next year. <laughs> it probably is. Uh, and my last one is, my last uh, prediction is Piastri scores higher uh, in the second half of the season than Lando did. Well, that's better than predicting uh, Lance Stroll's going to score more points than Fernando will. That's not possible. Uh, there's no way. There's, there's no way the universe would allow that to happen. But Piastri, I think there's a good chance that he, either through luck, but actually I think probably through being pretty good at driving the car, ends up outscoring Lando in the second half of the season. Not over the whole course of the season. I think Lando's got that because he had that podium. Was it two podiums? Does Piastri then like toss a podium hat to Lando and Lando throws it back? Uh, and... There we go. That's what we can hope for. So I, I, I think that's very plausible. Anyway. I, I, I think we're much better set up for our second half of the season predictions than our first half of the season predictions. We have data now. We have something that's, to go on. That's true. We, we've tuned our predictions Indeed, we've evaluated, ruminated, and decided on the true path forward. All right, so what's going to happen at Zandvoort? Uh, Max is just going to win. Sure. I have him down as a, a grand shalom. That's fastest lap, pole, and leading every lap? Yes. And the race the race win. There's no sprint, right? There is no sprint at Zandvoort. 
Our next sprint's in Austin. I feel like this has to be something that he does even more than just those, because that just seems like that's not that a crazy prediction. Um, wins wins by 30 seconds while driving backwards i don't i don't know while driving backwards i don't know uh the real question the real prediction should be where's perez at uh, zandvoort uh not second <laughs> harsh but real um and then the second one you've got here uh aston martin's dutch upgrades do not bring them back to the front i can believe that but i think it's gonna it is gonna improve i didn't say it's not going to improve i, I think I think I could see them moving ahead of the Ferraris, but I think they're going to be still behind the McLarens and Mercedes. Cynical statement. Is it because the Aston Martin improves or because the Ferrari goes backwards? I, I think it's generally because the Aston Martin's improved, but I think they've went gone the wrong way on their development. So, and McLaren and Mercedes have jumped them. So I think for Aston Martin to get back to something where they were, they're still going to be behind the uh, the Mercs and the, the Maccas. And Ferrari's just going to, the Ferrari's just going to languish where it is. Great. Uh, I don't know if I have any unique predictions for Zandvoort. I, ju- I think in my mind, I just see Zandvoort as, you know, Nigel Mansell's comment about it gives you one-tenth a lap. I feel like it gives, it's just, Max is just like, he's, it's, I mean, I know he lives in Monaco, but I feel like he's just at home and he's just, he's so relaxed. And on top of that, he has nothing to lose, right? He is in just such a great position. At his previous home Grand Prix last week, he ran well, or a couple weeks ago, he ran well. But let's not forget, Max has, he has three home Grand Prix. It's unfair. Where's the third? Austria. Oh yeah, good point. Ah, yeah, yeah. He's gonna get. He's gonna get the hat trick. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like Zan- Zanvo is a really interesting track. It's fun to drive in the game. Um, but at the same time, it's not random. You don't want to throw something out there like um, uh, we don't see the start because of orange smoke. Uh... No, that's that's inevitable. Is that the key part of this segment? And we have to remember: is it's a crazy prediction, and per our remit, it has to be plausible. And I don't know if I have any crazy or, pl- or plausible predictions at all. Uh, crazy pass using the high line in what, turn three or four, whatever that corner is? Oh, that's a great corner. That corner is great because everybody did it wrong in the first time and then they've all tweaked on how they do it and still nobody can quite get it right. It's a great corner. I love that corner. That's, the, the fact that there's a corner on the F1 calendar that nobody quite knows how to get right makes it an amazing corner. It's, it might be my favorite corner on the whole track, on the whole calendar. It's, it's great. You just watch people go into it and they're like, well, I suppose I'm going this way. And then you see them in the start and they're like, well, I'm going to go this other way instead. Oh, that worked. Maybe I'll try that next time. And then it doesn't work. Most corners at like Bonza are pretty good. Like Spa has some good corners. And then there's that corner at Zandvoort where it's like, that's a great corner. Does the Vegas track have any banked corners? No. No. I, mean, I, I, ba- wasn't, I wasn't sure if they constructed them to make them happen. As well, it, right? it has banked corners in a different sense of like, this is where they'll take on store all your money. Okay, yes. Uh, they will store all the money in their bank account uh, and not yours. Well, we have somehow talked for 52 minutes about absolutely nothing, so I think it's probably about time we wrap up. I will side with that before I come up with a stupid prediction that makes no sense. So, as always, thank you for listening. Uh, we are awaiting your feedback. Write into feedback at tinfoilhelmets.com and let us know your conspiracies, feedback, and wants. Also tell your friends to like, listen, rate, and subscribe to this most amazing of podcasts. Woo.